Hi everyone, good morning. Uh, um, we are here online in a perfect uh, English weather with a cloudy sky in LA today. Um, I'm happy to introduce very briefly this uh, webinar, the second webinar of, of our international committee. And I'm really proud about this webinar because it's a true international one as our committee is. Um, the International Committee of the Beverly Hills Bar Association now is counting more and more members and I really encourage everyone uh, that is not yet a member to join us. I think that uh, you're going to find uh, a perfect uh, environment and international one, of course, in which you can uh, develop your skills uh, from, um, from, a, from an international perspective, uh, from a local perspective well, as well. We have people from uh, many jurisdictions, uh, including uh, Europe, Africa, Latin America, um, South America, uh, Asia, and a lot of US as well. Uh, so I just want to welcome everybody, and I'm particularly proud of the people that are making the webinar today, because they're people that I know since a very long time, they're great professionals, and uh, they're members of the committee as well. So please join us as soon as possible, and leave the word to Adina Saviano, one of our most active members to start the webinar. Thank you, Adina. Thank you, Alessandra. I'm Adina Saviano, and I'm glad to uh, join us today for the discussion of an important topic, Brexit, what happens now. And I will uh, introduce the speakers, um, starting with Mark Birdsworth. Mark is a partner in uh, Cadwater's White Collar Defense and Investigation Group, resident in the London office. He focuses his practice in the defense of serious fraud, conducts international investigations for corporates, regulators, and other entities, and advises companies and their directors on governance issues. He helps clients to avoid compliance in criminal risk in a wide range of scenarios. Mark is recognized as a leader in the field of commercial fraud in the Legal 500 and Chambers and Partners Directory. He also was recognized as a global leader in Who's Who Legal, Business Crime Defense Investigation 2019. Mark is chair of the American Bar Association International White Collar Crime Committee. He is a representative of the Association Internationale de Jeunes Avocats and a member of the American Bar Association section of the International Law and the Law Society. Mark received his LB from the University of Manchester and he's admitted to practice in England and Wales. Welcome, Mark. And the question for you is, what is the latest situation with the United Kingdom Brexit negotiation, please? Thank you very much, Adina, and um, hello, everybody. Um, and thank you for the, for the, for the question. Um, it probably requires a, a bit of background, and I should say from the outset that um, it's all my fault because I didn't vote. Um, I went to vote. I was in the line or in the queue, as we say. And I had a very important meeting in London. I live in Cambridge, where it's raining now, obviously. Um, and I missed the vote. And, you know, here we are. Um, and the fact of the matter is that the UK has always had an unstable relationship with mainland Europe. Um, Winston Churchill was a Europhile. He was the, the founding father of the idea of the United States of Europe. But his attitude sums up Britain. Uh, we have our own dream and our own task. We are with Europe, but not of it. We are linked, but not combined. We are interested and associated, but we are not absorbed. He also remarked somewhat romantically, if Britain must choose between Europe and the open sea, you must always choose the open sea. 
So there we are. Uh, and we'd already opted ourselves out of the border control, Schengen. We already had our own currency. We didn't adopt the euro. So we were already in our own category. And the issue of, of Europe was politically across generations and, and for decades, even centuries of politics, the most controversial and dividing of all topics for our mainstream political parties. Um, so it was felt in 2016 that our existence in the EU had to be put to the people uh, once and for all. So in June 2016, 52% of us decided they did not want to be combined or absorbed and cast as adrift. So uh, I'm going to have a think about whether we are now cruising confidently into the sunset, gin and tonic in hand, or are we at sea? up a creek without a paddle, uh, waving frantically perhaps as the sharks circle. So I'm just gonna set the scene um, with some brief background and context, answering the question of where we are before I pass it over to those more adept than me uh, for the detail of this complex and controversial topic. So the UK left the EU on Friday the 31st of January 2020, following the approval of a withdrawal agreement agreed between the UK and the EU in October 2019. And this means that the UK is no longer part of the political and economic union of EU member states. Um, so those EU treaties or the legislation and the case law um, all go. So there are 12,000 rules and regulations that the UK now needs to enact uh, as of the beginning of next year. So plenty of work for lawyers. Geographically, of course, we are still part of Europe. We can't choose a new continent, um, which is perhaps a shame, but there it is. Uh, and, and what is the, the current status? Well, as part of the withdrawal agreement negotiations, an implementation period was agreed, and that runs until the 31st of December this year. So the UK is temporarily uh, a member of the single market and customs union and continues to be subject to EU regulations. Uh, and so UK citizens resident in the EU and EU citizens resident in the UK prior to the UK's departure largely enjoy at the moment the same rights as they did before. Uh, so for the time being, uh, life remains the same regarding current rules on trade, travel and business in the UK and uh, EU at least until 11 o'clock on uh, the 31st of December uh, this year. In terms of the law and the, those EU regulations and the rulings of the European Court of Justice, of course, it used to be the case that we were subject to uh, uh, EU law uh, following the European Communities Act of 1972. So many of those laws uh, came into UK law automatically, something called direct effect, uh, and that will go next year. But for the time being, we still do have um, 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 those laws and those rules and the withdrawal agreement provides that during this transition period that we're in at the moment, the EU will treat the UK as it is uh, still uh, a, an EU uh, member state uh, and the laws will um, continue to uh, apply. The UK doesn't participate in the EU institutions and, government, uh, and governance structures at the moment. So, for example, we're, we're not part of the process that uh, appoints European judges. Um, so the UK will be bound by obligations uh, stemming from the EU's international agreements during uh, transition, but crucially we can negotiate uh, and we have to negotiate uh, new agreements, providing that those don't come into, into force uh, during the transition um, um, period. And the European Court of Justice um, stays in effect in its jurisdiction um, during this period. Um, so obviously we're now in this in this sort of key area where we've got the, this standstill period and the purpose of the standstill period created by withdrawal uh, agreement is to resolve the elephant in the room this treaty problem because Britain will ultimately withdraw from the body of treaties that it has with the EU those trade agreements and it will have to conclude new ones and it's going to have to conclude new ones with the EU it's going to have to conclude you know, new ones with other key partners such as the US Japan Australia, New Zealand and Canada, and that's not going, going very well. Uh, we've only got one at the moment with, with, uh, with, with uh, Japan, um, and we need more. We need to do a deal with, with the EU as well. Um, obviously, that agreement will have to take place by um, December, or an extension will, will, will have, to, have to happen. So 
And this is the big question for the remainder of 2020. Will there be a, a UK and EU um, trading relationship? Um, or will no agreement happen at all? Three days ago, it was all off. Two days ago, it's back on a little bit, but we just, we just, we just don't, don't know. If we don't have an agreement, then we revert to the usual international trading rules of the World Trade Organization. Um, um, let's see what happens. I, I, I think there'll be some sort of deal, small deal, and then there'll be an incremental change. Um, but, but watch this space. So just, just briefly, some of these areas just to touch on, and they may well be developed um, um, later on. But, but three things which, you know, are at the front of this sort of conversation. The border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, a contagious issue. EU access to UK fisheries, believe it or not, fish is a big issue, and financial services. Financial services are tremendously important to the UK, um, how financial services can um, um, develop a dark trade around Europe will be um, a, big, uh, a big issue. Um, um, one possibility is, for example, that the UK exceeds on tariffs and trading um, and goes to World Trade Organization terms, you know, in the event of, of not reaching a, a, a broad deal and then some sort of interim, interim agreement um, with, with all of these potential um, hot topics sort of taken uh, into account. As far as the US is concerned, we're going to hear more about this. Um, you know, this is another tremendously hot topic in the UK. Um, are the UK going to cede on allowing the US access to our national health service? You know, are, are the agribusiness lobbyists going to win and all those meetings that they're having with the senators, are they going to result um, in the ability to trade in relation to, to food and agri with the UK? And will there be um, uh, what, we, what many commentators think will be a perceived reduction in food hygiene and animal uh, welfare standards as a result? Um, um, at the moment, the UK government says, no, that's not going to happen. I personally think it will have to, and there will be some concession uh, on those matters uh, as we, as we go, go forward. So whilst we're at sea, let's talk about fish. Um, the topic of fisheries may sound quite curious, but it is set to play an important uh, role this year in the negotiations. That's because the UK will become an independent coastal state at the end of this year. The government intends, you know, like Norway and Iceland, um, that they will have you know, access to waters and they will have fishing opportunities. Uh, this could have a big impact on other European countries, such as France. Um, again, I think this is going to be a bargaining chip. I think that we'll give away some of our um, um, fishing rights in order to play nicely uh, with, with other countries. Um, but, but, it, but a very much a... Um, a hot topic and, and something that's being um, addressed and is going to cover a lot of colour inches in the weeks and months ahead. On the issue of security and criminal justice, I think this is a tremendously important area for Brexit and, and the UK. Um, um, we've played a very active role in Europol, Eurojust, um, issues of mutual legal assistance between member states of the EU, uh, European arrest warrants. These are all things that have been very much in play and very useful and valuable to the European area. Um, apparently, we understand that this is, this is agreed and we're going to get an announcement on this and we are still going to play an active part in, in security and criminal justice. And I think that's a very um, an, an important thing. Uh, and so overall, we'll want to reach a pragmatic agreement with the EU uh, to provide a, a framework for law enforcement, a framework for treaties, uh, and, you know, almost on a daily basis, we'll be getting announcements about this between now and the end of December. So I'd like to finish and summarise that this is a very complicated area. Scotland uh, voted to remain in the EU. They now probably want a referendum on independence. Uh, we might leave Europe. We might lose Scotland. Uh, we've got 3.5 million Europeans currently in the UK going through a settlement scheme, which means they're being assessed. Um, the UK taxpayers are paying for that. It costs 200 million. By June next year, all those EU residents will find out whether they're going to be allowed to remain in the UK. Um, all I can say uh, in uh, conclusion and to finish is, if you remember back, I didn't vote. So if anyone on this seminar at the moment, in the coming days or weeks, has an opportunity to vote, uh, my advice is do vote, or else you might end up at sea like I am. Thanks.
Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Um, I would like to introduce our second speaker. It's Pablo Mesquita Ortega. Welcome, Pablo. Thank you A very much, Mark. About... Uh, nice to see you, Pablo. A few words about uh, Pablo. He obtained his LLM Master of Law specializing in uh, business law from the US USC Law School in 2015. Previously, uh, Pablo obtained his bachelor degree in law and business from the Universidad Pontificia de Camillo, Madrid in 2009, Spain. Pablo is admitted to practice law in Spain since November 2009. Upon graduation from law school, Pablo specialized in international business law, obtaining a scholarship from the Spanish government to give legal advice to Spanish renewable energy companies in Berlin, Germany, aiming to establish their businesses in Berlin, Brandenburg. Starting in 2011, Pablo focused on international taxation, working for Garike, the largest law firm in continental Europe, advising national and international corporations in tax laws, trying to optimize their fiscal responsibilities while performing international trade activities. Pablo currently works in the Domingos firm, Los Angeles, California, specialized in litigation and personal injury cases. Um, thank you. So the first question for you, Pablo, please will be, what kind of deal is desirable under the perspective of the European Union? And what do you think the outcome is going to be? Uh, so, uh, thank you, Arina, for the introduction. Um, I have to say that uh, Brexit has been uh, probably the biggest setback in the project of uh, European construction that, and European integration that started um, after World War II. Uh, now, uh, the strategy of the European Union, in my opinion, is going to be trying to keep a um, prosperous and um, intense uh, relationship with the United Kingdom. But at the same time, uh, they have to be careful uh, in that the scenario that they create for the United Kingdom uh, doesn't make it too attractive uh, for other countries to follow and leave the European Union. So they are going to try to keep that balance. I believe uh, both parties are interested in a deal. Um, some people have wondered who is more interested in a deal. Uh, both are. I'm going to give you um, two figures. Uh, in 2018, according to Eurostat, 46% of UK exports went to the European Union. 7% uh, of European Union exports went to the UK. So uh, after uh, reading these figures, you may think, well, maybe the UK is more interested, but also the European Union is interested because 7% is a considerable number. So uh, both parties want a deal, uh, but not at any price, as they keep repeating. Uh, the EU chief negotiator, uh, uh, Michel Barnier, and the uh, UK government negotiator, David Frost. Uh, it's going to be a tough and long negotiation. Uh, like Mark uh, suggested, I believe there is going to be some kind of a deal. Uh, I believe it will be, since there is no time and there are many complex issues to talk about and to agree on, uh, I believe it will be a very general declaration of principles and the uh, specific aspects and their negotiation will follow in the coming years. I believe that is what is going to happen. Uh, there will be some more setbacks in the negotiations, but uh, it's just in the interest of both parties uh, to make some kind of a deal and avoid a disorderly uh, Brexit. Um, what are the points uh, that are being more controversial in the negotiations? Uh, for the European Union, uh, they keep repeating, it is very interesting, it, very interesting to maintain what in trade terms has been called a level playing field. Uh, the European Union is really concerned, um, and uh, the European Union negotiators, they are concerned about uh, the UK remaining in the single market and the customs union, and uh, at the same time, uh, their companies being allowed uh, to receive advantages in terms of uh, softer environmental laws or in terms of um, possibly government help, uh, subsidies, tax credits. So, uh, basically, this principle means the European Union does not want uh, any UK company to get any advantages uh, of this kind and at the same time remain in the single market because it would mean, it would mean unfair competition. Uh, I believe this is an area uh, where the UK is going to be more flexible uh, because the position of the European Union uh, has been rigid at the moment. Um, 
but I, the position of the UK is that they are the most interested in this aspect. They basically want to keep trading with the continent and the European Union at zero tariff. And this aspect also affects, like Mark suggested, uh, the, the issue of the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Uh, as we know, the Republic of Ireland is, is going to remain a member of the European Union and Northern Ireland uh, is still uh, part of the UK. Uh, a hard border in Northern Ireland uh, would constitute possible violations of the uh, Big Friday agreements. Uh, so the UK is interested in uh, keeping that border soft, so to speak. Uh, a second area where the negotiations are being uh, complicated is the area of dispute resolution. This basically means uh, if uh, one of the parties does not comply with uh, the terms of the final deal, uh, where do they go to uh, resolve disputes? What court? The European Union obviously is uh, putting pressure to keep um, the uh, European Court of Justice as uh, a referee and as a court um, to go to. Um, on the other hand, the United Kingdom uh, is uh, bringing to the table the WTO uh, and abiding by the rules. Those rules, uh, th this issue is complicated because those rules are uh, very complex. Uh, it takes a long time. Uh, there is another problem that, which is individuals cannot go to the WTO. Uh, that is only for, for states. Um, let alone the last uh, developments with the Trump administration here in the United States, uh, which have weakened uh, the stance of the WTO as a possible arbiter or referee to resolve international disputes. Uh, to give you an example of a case that uh, has been there for years and years and uh, no progress has been made uh, is the dispute between Airbus and Boeing. It's been going on for six years in the WTO, nothing has happened yet. So uh, here at Dina, I don't know what to tell you what is going to be the final compromise. Uh, it's complicated. Some people are talking about arbitration. Um, Others are talking about uh, a specific uh, area in the European Court of Justice just for um, dispute resolutions uh, related to Brexit. Here, we don't know, it's hard to predict uh, what is gonna happen. And a third topic in dispute, like Mark um, suggested, is uh, the issue of fisheries. Um, here, um, especially France uh, is very interested in having access to UK waters for their fishing vessels. Mm -hmm. uh, the UK has said that uh, after Brexit, um, they will keep control of their waters. They will be an independent, totally independent nation in that regard. Uh, here in the last couple of days, we've already seen that the European position and the French position in particular has softened. So here is where I think that the European Union will concede and uh, access will be uh, uh, very limited, possible, but very limited in the final declaration of principles that I believe will happen uh, in about November. So these are basically the three areas of the negotiation that are being um, harder at this point and uh, that are occupying most of the time of the negotiating teams. And how do you think the trade relationship between the United States and European Union is going to be affected by Brexit? So uh, at this point, uh, most economists and uh, business leaders in the area, they, uh, they believe it's not going to be uh, greatly affected because the uh, trade rules and regulations between the United States and the European Union uh, remain under effect. So uh, most of these leaders and uh, experts, they believe that uh, if there is any effect in the trade relationship will be um, due to uh, fear and doubts about the outcome of this whole process, uh, maybe volatility in the markets, uh, or maybe some tensions in the uh, market of a uh, sovereign bond uh, of some European countries. Uh, that is what can be anticipated that uh, could have an effect in the US-EU uh, trade relationship. Uh, apart from that, uh, it's hard to predict. I don't believe it's going to be greatly affected. Uh, the U.S. election, the upcoming U.S. election, will have more of an effect because, uh, as you may know, uh, with the previous administration, there was a free uh, trade agreement negotiation ongoing between the European Union and the United States. 
Uh, the new administration froze those negotiations uh, in the spring of uh, 2017. So um, if there is a new administration in the United States, it is possible that those talks are resumed. Uh, that will have more of an effect than Brexit, in my opinion, in the EU-US trade relationship. I agree. Pablo, without a doubt, the nego negotiations in the upcoming days are going to be very complex. How are they being carried out and how has trust been affected by the recent development of the situation? So uh, at this point, uh, you know, the uh, Article 5 of the Withdrawal Agreement uh, established a principle of good faith uh, between the parties. Um, that was maintained until uh, at the beginning of September uh, this year, the uh, UK approved um, the UK Internal Market Bill. Uh, that already established regulations as to uh, the exchange of goods between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Uh, that is a violation of the withdrawal agreement. Uh, representatives of the UK government have uh, admitted uh, that they violated the withdrawal agreement in this regard, which, uh, which is a violation of international law. Uh, that has affected trust, uh, for sure, between the parties. And actually, after um, the UK uh, refused to withdraw this bill, it affected the negotiations, uh, which have been frozen for the last uh, two to three weeks. Uh, yesterday, they have been resumed as they are being aware that uh, they are running out of time. But it is true that trust uh, is low uh, due to the enactment by the United Kingdom of this bill. Uh, I still think that the strong desire by both parties to uh, do this in an orderly manner, an orderly fashion, uh, will overcome uh, this lack of trust that the um, UK internal bill has created and uh, a final deal declaration of principles will be possible. But it is true that there is the trust between the parties, Michel Barnier and uh, David Frost is very low due to the enactment of the UK internal market bill. Thank you very much, Pablo. You're welcome. I'm glad to introduce uh another valuable speaker, Anna Bortwistle. Welcome, Anna. Anna is a partner at Ferrer & Co. It's, Anna is a partner in the employment team and advises the United States and other multinational companies with operations in the United Kingdom, as well as advising senior executives. She has served as chair of the International Employment Committee of the American Bar Association International Law Section. Anna? Hi, Adina. Hi, welcome. Anna, I would like to ask you, in your role as an employment lawyer, your concern with human capital, and uh, so aside from Brexit, Brexit impacting trade, what do you see as the biggest impact that Brexit may have on the United States uh, companies operating in the United Kingdom? Sure. Do you know, I might start by saying, though, that I now blame Mark Beardsworth for um, the position we find ourselves in now. Um, I certainly voted and it didn't go the way that I wanted, but there we have it. Um, look, so yes, um, I'm not going to be talking about trade because I'm an employment lawyer. So primarily what I'm interested in is human capital and people. Um, and look, I think the biggest impact that we're talking about, um, if you're thinking about Brexit and, and how that's going to impact businesses, isn't so much a legal one, um, but it's one of talent acquisition. So will Brexit make it more difficult for businesses operating in the UK? Whether you're talking about American businesses or you're just take, talking about UK domestic companies, will it make it more difficult for those, those businesses to attract talent in from overseas? And I think the answer is possibly yes. Um, I'm sure many of you will have heard the, the term war for talent. Um, if you haven't, uh, it's a term that was coined over 20 years ago by some authors at McKinsey. Um, and in a book of the same name, authors at McKinsey predicted that the make or break as to the success for firms over the next 20, 20 years would be their ability to attract and develop and retain talent. Um, and now we are 20 years forward. So you fast forward 20 years and those challenges have only increased um, as a result of globalization, obviously. Um, as well as, I think, businesses having to deal with the millennial workforce and new priorities um, of that workforce. 
So what does that mean for Brexit? Um, well, look, forecasters already have been saying that the UK fares pretty badly um, in terms of the war for talent, in that the UK already has a severe talent deficit. And I think the greatest threat that Brexit poses then for businesses is simply one of uncertainty. We've had for a period of four years now um, the uncertainty of whether we're coming out of the EU and obviously at the moment whether we're crashing out with no deal or with a deal. So that business uncertainty, I think, um, is, is also compounded by the fact um, that we're going through this global pandemic. Um, and I'll come back to that and explain why I think um, that COVID actually is, is relevant as well as Brexit in terms of looking um, for businesses at talent acquisition. So the threat, I think, to talent acquisition for businesses in the UK is quite a simple one. And that's basically that where you um, have the UK uh, being in a place of uncertainty in terms of financial stability and growth, then businesses understandably put off some strategic decision making. And that in relation to people includes hiring freezes. So this literally has a chilling effect on, on business growth. And you add to that the uncertainty from an individual's perspective. So on the one hand, you have businesses maybe taking a pause on hiring decisions, but on the other side, you have individuals that are gonna be more cautious about jumping ship and taking a risk to change jobs. And that's even more so if you're talking about a business in the UK wanting to hire for, from overseas. Um, from a legal perspective, Brexit obviously causes a really big change in terms of a change in migration patterns. So obviously what we do have now is that there will be the end of free movement for European EU nationals. And that means that EU or previously EU nationals are going to be on the same footing as other foreign nationals when it comes to getting work permit rights. Um, so is there any good news? Uh, well, look, arguably, um, while the end of free movement may cause, well, will cause a further obstacle for EU workers wanting to come and work in the UK, and Mark has already touched on that. Um, what I hear actually from a lot of immigration specialists in the UK, and, I, and I'm not an immigration specialist, but what I hear is that in response to Brexit, what has actually happened with the immigration system as a whole is that it has been simplified and streamlined. So whilst it may be more difficult to bring in EU nationals, actually as a whole, looking across the globe, it may be easy to, easier to bring, thing, bring people in. Um, I just want to turn really quickly to COVID because I mentioned that I think there's an overlap here in terms of talent acquisition. Um, and this might sound like quite a controversial point, but I think there's potentially one positive impact of COVID when it comes to talent acquisition, if there can you know, in, be a positive in all of this. Um, and that's because COVID has brought about an entire change in the way that we work. And effectively, we have had a global test on whether remote working really does work. And we, we have found that it does. You know, the technology has been in place for years and yet it's taken us until now to actually give it a real go. And what does that mean? Well, it means the possibility, and this doesn't just apply to the UK, but it means the possibility of UK businesses having access to a global talent pool, albeit that they're not going to be based in the UK. Um, and I might end there just because that is at least a cautiously optimistic note to, to end uh, my answer on. Thank you, Anna. And another question for you, if you can tell us, please, uh, how do you think is anticipating Brexit will impact employment protections in the United Kingdom? And will this make it more or less attractive for United States companies for open subsidiaries in the United Kingdom versus, for example, Amsterdam or Frankfurt? Um, sure. Uh, well, look, Mark has already explained some of this in that at the moment we're in a transitional period. And that remains in place until the end of the year. So as things stand right now, everything is, is the same legally from an employment perspective, as well as, you know, generally in terms of our legal position. Um, what it means is that all EU derived law remains in place. Um, it, it means that at least until the end of this year, the ECJ continues to have jurisdiction in the UK. But of course, this will change come the 1st of January 2021. Um, Right now, and, and 
this is perhaps not so surprising where you've obviously got the government um, dealing and negotiating in very big matters of significance in terms of trade. But right now, there haven't been any official statements from the government as to what's going to happen with employment legislation from the 1st of January 2021. What they're not saying is that with the ability to bring in new laws, they're actually considering bringing in new laws. Um, that said, uh, employment lawyers, at least, have read a lot into the fact that under Boris Johnson, where there was previously within the withdrawal agreement, a firm statement which would be legally binding to say that employment law would be kept at a, a level playing field effectively with the EU, that statement was moved from being legally binding in the withdrawal agreement to a non-legally non binding um, political declaration. And so into that, people have read that potentially the government are thinking about a shift in, um, in employment laws away from, from the EU. Um, obviously, from the 1st of January, there's the impact that the ECJ um, will no longer have jurisdiction over the UK courts. In the employment context, um, that is thought of as being quite relevant for us because traditionally the ECJ has been at least felt to be more employee friendly than the British courts have been. So, so that is another signifier of a potential move. Um, and some people will say that that may result in a more business friendly employment law environment um, for, for companies operating here. I think potentially for my US corporate clients who regularly find our employment laws um, quite difficult to get their heads around, particularly in, in relation to things like how, sort of how procedural employment law is here, the fact that we don't have employment at will and we have unfair dismissal protections. But for them, you know, I've been asked the question by many U US companies whether things that, you know, we're going to have a much easier system to deal with when we're looking at our employee workforce in the UK from um, 2021. Um, unfortunately, I have to say, I, I'm not convinced that that will, in fact, be the case. Um, look, I think, coming back to your question, that uh, US companies will have still very strong reasons why they might look to open a subsidiary in the UK first, as their first foot into Europe, rather than, say, Amsterdam or Frankfurt. But I have to say that I don't think that that is because we are going to end up in a position where Brexit means that our employment laws are friendlier towards companies. Um, why do I think this? Well, at least for starters, the reality is that um, UK employment law as a whole anyway is in many ways more favourable than you have at our, in our sort of counterparts in Europe. So France, just to name one country, has far more employee-friendly employment laws than we have here. Um, Equally, why don't I think um, Brexit's going to sort of result in a swathe of change for employment law? Well, for one thing, many of our employment protections aren't um, European derived. They're actually UK derived. So things like equal pay or discrimination rights. Well, they were fundamental laws actually prior to the UK joining um, the EU. And equally, we have a lot of domestic law protections, things like unfair dismissal, um, things like shared parental leave that haven't derived from the EU. I think the second reason why I don't, I don't see that we're going to have a lot of new laws coming in place from, from next year is that actually a lot of the EU-derived laws are effectively woven into the fabric of society. So what I don't see is that, that you know, any chance of us backing away from discrimination protections, for example, or family rights or holiday rights. Um, now, that isn't to say that um, if we have no deal, there isn't an increased likelihood of, of sort of a change in the position of, of English employment law. But I think that that will be a gradual change. But on the flip side, what, what I certainly think to be the case is that if a trade deal is reached, I think in that scenario, um, employment law is likely to be one of the areas where the government is going to give away concessions and ensure that the UK remains broadly in line with EU worker protections. And that's really coming back to a point that Pablo mentioned earlier around level playing field. I think that as part of any trade deal, if one is done, then employment law will, will certainly be um, one of those areas. Um, I'll wrap up now, but maybe with, with one final point. Um, I said that, that I thought the US companies would still consider uh, the UK to be an attractive place to, inv to invest. 
And this is unashamedly a, a plug for sort of a post-Brexit Britain, which I didn't vote for, I say again. Um, and I think that that is going to come down um, not to anything like employment laws or anything of that kind. I think it is going to come down to the cultural links, for example, that we have with the US. From a legal point of view, I don't think we can underestimate um, the fact that we're linked by our, our common law heritage. I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you for your information. Uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Su, welcome. Uh, I would like to introduce you. Uh, Jonathan is a Los Angeles solo attorney. He started his legal education in England. Uh, attended the University of London, graduating with an LLB in English law. Jonathan returned to Los Angeles for LLM at the UCLA. Like Pablo Mesquita, he is a contributing member of the International Committee of the Beverly Hills Bar Association. Welcome, Jonathan. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Nice to see you. Uh, Jonathan, I would like to ask you, how is the United States United Kingdom trade negotiation going? Yeah, uh, compared to the EU negotiation, it's been very bureaucratic. Uh, on the EU-UK uh, trade deal, famously, uh, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, interfered to try to kickstart or restart those trade negotiations. So there's been no political interference in that sense uh, with the U.S. trade deal. Uh, it started this year in May. It had to start uh, when the e UK formally left the EU. Uh, and we're currently on round five of trade talks. It actually started on Tuesday, so October the 20th. Uh, what they do is they meet for two weeks uh, virtually these days, but then they go away for four weeks and work it out amongst themselves and then come back. So we're on the fifth round of that. And uh, I think we're maybe going to need a sixth or more rounds. Uh, I want to, Dina, briefly say why this matters and why it's important to me or why it interests me. And to build on what Anna was saying, uh, this U.S.-U.K. trade relationship is worth hundreds of billions of, of dollars going both ways. Uh, it's one of the relationships the U.S. has where it has a trade surplus. Uh, the U.K. is the U.S.'s fifth largest export market. The U.S. is the U.K.'s seventh largest export market. And before the pandemic, the statistics were saying that this was a growing trade relationship. And uh, to Anna's point and why it matters so much is that the largest sector was service industries going back and forth. Uh, on the U.S. side, we're represented by the Office of the Trade Representative. Uh, that's an executive branch. He's a Senate appointed or Senate confirmed rather uh, appointment. Uh, the current representative is Robert Leithheiser. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if our listeners know him. He was at Skadden for a very long time as a trade lawyer. And uh, he was confirmed in a bipartisan way, 82 to 14 vote. And uh, he walks into this negotiation uh, with the USMCA, the uh, renegotiated NAFTA deal under his belt. So, uh, but ultimately he will negotiate a deal and, and present the paperwork, but ultimately it will be the Congress who will have to approve it. They have uh, the, that right under Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution to regulate commerce with foreign nations. So whatever he brings, he'll have to go through the House and the Senate in a up and down vote. Thank you. And uh, what effect, if any, do you think the U.S. election will have on the outcome of the trade deal? Uh, yeah, I, I think. Word, please. Oh, absolutely. So I, in, in short, to keep it uh, till I have time for questions, th I think there's room for continuity and there's room for disparity. Uh, I, I also want to talk about the British side. Uh, we haven't done that much. Uh, the, the Boris Johnson called an election last year. And uh, he won that election. And what he did with that election was that he increased his majority. And he also um, uh, was able to govern without a coalition partner. Ironically, his coalition partner was from Northern Ireland, a Northern Irish party. And so with that, that and the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, which basically, uh, regardless of political interference or political issues, they will have a five-year term. So he's looking at governing up until 2024. So there's relative stability on the British side. Uh, they're currently really interested in us as we have the upcoming November election. And it's important not just for the presidential race, but also in the Congress. As I said before, they'll be the ultimate ones deciding it. Uh, it's been very interesting that actually the key issue for the U.S. side amongst our political leaders in a bipartisan way has been the Northern Irish issue. Uh, on, the, on the current administration, they've spoken against the hard border. Uh, 
And there's actually a special envoy uh, to Northern Ireland. His name is Mick, Mick Mulvaney. Uh, he used to be the, uh, the, uh, the director of the Office of, Manage, but, uh, Office of uh, Budget Management. So he was quite a key player in Washington. And so to put someone that important into that role, I think says that this is, a, is an important matter to them. And you've also seen, you know, Speaker Pelosi has spoken out and saying there will be no deal if there is a hard border, if the Northern Irish protocols aren't followed. And uh, potentially, if uh, President, uh, Vice President Biden wins the election, uh, he has Irish roots, he's Catholic, this is something that he's spoken out that matters to him as well. So, uh, yeah, watch this space. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. We have some time for the question and answers. And um, I would like to ask our panelists, I've seen some question in the chat from Brian Atwell to all of you, please. The question is, in 2019, the United States Ambassador Sondland stated that he wished to destroy the United European. Under the current US administration, it appears that economic concerns are dwarfed by strategic matters. Do you agree, disagree, and why, please? Okay, Mark, what do you think? I, I, I responded to Brian by asking whether the question is... is I saw that. I saw that. I thought Mark should uh, start the lead here. Well, I mean, if the question is, you know, is, is the current U.S. administration more concerned about strategy than economic issues, then, you know, I would defer to a U.S. resident on, on, on that. You're much closer to the action. But I think what, what definitely we can say, Brian, is that is that these, these negotiations will not be decided purely on economic terms. It's not just about where the money is and who's going to get the most money and, and what's best for the economy. As John quite rightly says, and all the speakers have, have, have touched on this, there is so much at play here. It's about um, the Irish border. Um, it's about all of those votes that people want to get uh, about the politics. So there'll be some trade-offs here. You know, there will be compromises. The world compromises on agriculture, um, and some sort of deal or some sort of framework deal, I think, I think will be done. And absolutely, all parties will be uh, negotiating and making deals strategically and for political reasons, for their own power and to retain their power, and not just uh, for the benefit of the populations and, and, and not for economic reasons. Yes, I also want to add, I believe that uh, the uh, result of the upcoming U.S. election uh, is going to have a consequence and an influence on Brexit. Uh, the uh, potential administrations that may come up after the election have very different views as to um, that trend of integration that has been going on uh, since the end of World War II uh, versus uh, a policy of... Uh, restricting trade activity, strengthening borders, uh, and nationalistic views, uh, if you want to call it that way, as to uh, trade. Uh, we have seen that with the implementation of uh, tariffs um, to goods coming from Asia and uh, also uh, from Europe. So if you also consider that uh, Joe Biden, uh, when he was vice president, he was one of the administration's uh, most outspoken um, uh, anti-Brexiteers. Um, you may wonder what's going to happen uh, if he wins this election and uh, how is that going to affect um, a potential um, free trade agreement between the UK and the US versus uh, the current administration being re-elected um, in which they openly uh, spoke against the current structure of NATO. Uh, they've been very outspoken as to uh, what they called uh, the Brussels prison uh, as to regulations. So uh, I believe that the result of the U.S. election is going to have a considerable influence in the implementation of Brexit. Um, if a new administration is elected, uh, Brian, I would say they will appoint a new ambassador that uh, views the European Union and that process of integration of the European uh, continent in a more uh, favorable way. So uh, it, the answer to your question is also going to depend on um, what happens on November 3rd here in the United States. Dina, if I can jump in. Please, Jonathan. 
So, uh, yeah, just to expand on what Pablo said, I found it very interesting when I was looking it up. Uh, this conservative government in England has been there since 2010. And yes, they've had three prime ministers, but it's been the same party uh, for the past decade or so. Uh, but if uh, Joe Biden is elected, he will be the third U.S. administration this that parliament will have seen, this uh, conservative party will have seen. And I think the thing that matters the most is actually an issue of priorities as well. Uh, I don't think either candidate has you know, articulated a foreign policy vision for the next four years, whether it's uh, President Trump's second term or it's Joe Biden's administration. Uh, but maybe if we articulate what they've been doing now, we could see, I think maybe with a, a second Trump term, it, when we might be talking about focus on the China trade deal. Part one was signed earlier this year and it's far from finished. Maybe that becomes a priority. Uh, with the Joe Biden administration, I think uh, the first hundred days we're talking about COVID stimulus and domestic issues taking precedent. So it, there's possibility that this might be on the back burner or it becomes uh, an important part of an administration's economic uh, stimulus kind of uh, a package of things to kind of restart the economy. Thank you. I'll just jump in maybe in, in, just in, in just one point, John, that you made, that, that's interesting. But it's worth pointing out that, yes, the Conservative Party have been in since 2010, and I know you've already said there's three prime ministers, but worthwhile bearing in mind that Boris is the Brexiteer prime minister. So there is a, you know, a distinct exactly, issue yes. here in that you know, we had David Cameron um, initially, who obviously called this ref referendum, but wasn't a Brexiteer. So you have... Yeah. You know, there is a shift here and, and I would just echo actually what, what Mark and Pablo, you were also saying, you know, this is just hugely political as well. So yes, you know, the strategic side of this rather than simply the economics are huge, um, including where obviously Boris Johnson now is um, facing a lot of difficulties um, politically in the country, uh, you know, as part of COVID fall, fallout in, in, in particular. Um, so I think it is, you know, a lot of this is very much determined by who is in power. And certainly I, I agree that from a U.S. perspective, what happens in the U.S. elections is going to be re you know, very relevant. Thank you very much. Uh, another question for our panelists is, uh, will a European Union law still enforceable on the U United Kingdom trade deal before and after December 31st? Tell us a few words what they think. So uh, I believe Mark mentioned at the beginning of the panel that uh, it is part of the withdrawal agreement that uh, the European Court of Justice uh, still hears uh, matters related to uh, EU-UK um, trade, uh, then also the single market and the customs union. Uh, the idea in the UK is that uh, after January 1st, 2021, um, the European Court of Justice should not hear uh, these matters any longer. And accordingly, uh, no EU rules and regulations uh, will be applicable to any trade uh, coming in and out of the United Kingdom. Uh, that is the idea, but um, uh, based on that principle of level playing field and how uh, the EU is going to be strict in the area of avoiding any advantages uh, to UK companies if they want to remain in the single market at zero tariff, um, I believe some kind of application uh, will be implemented of EU laws and regulations in trade, uh, at least coming in and out of the EU from the UK. So uh, in answering that question, uh, right now uh, they are applicable as before January 2020, after December, the idea in the UK is that we'll, they will not be applicable, but it is my opinion that as a result of this negotiation, uh, the EU laws and regulations maybe may not be strictly applicable, but the spirit of those norms in terms of uh, no state aid, no advantages, uh, strict environmental laws uh, is still going to be, uh, it's, it's still going to have an effect in uh, the UK trade uh, transactions with the European Union. Thank you, Pablo. Um, I would like to address the uh, Edward Kepo question to the panelists and is asking if somebody has any observations about the likely fate of the UK's digital services tax in the UK-US trade deal negotiations. Well, I have no idea. 
Um, it's definitely one of those things that's somewhere in the crystal ball, which, you know, we, we can guess about. I, I appreciate the comment that, that Johnson is at the moment aligned with the EU. But the short point is that everything is up for grabs. I mean, it, it, it's quite possible that as part of a wider trade deal, any of these issues on, on digital, digital taxes, um, you know, the NHS, uh, agribusness, uh, it, 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 it all could be there and part and parcel. And there'll be trade-offs. So we might be discussing digital tax for huge US corporates, you know, alongside um, deals on, on, on 5G and, and deals on, on the NHS and all sorts of things. Um, there's a, there's a built-in question which is also there, which is about about regulation. Um, you know, will there be less will there be less regulation in the UK? The answer to that is absolutely yes. There has to be. The whole point of Brexit and the, what the Brexiteers were running is basically: look, take the shackles off, unleash us. Um, we're much better than this. We can do more business and better business without these crazy EU rules. And that's what everybody voted for. So Boris Johnson now is basically saying he's going to get Brexit done. And get, getting Brexit done basically means having less of these EU rules, these EU ties. And some of them are going to have to be there. There's no doubt about it. There's going to have to be compromise. There's going to have to be a level playing field to participate in Europe. But overall, there's going to be um, much less regulation. And that means that there will be room to do you know, these deals and have these agreements um, and provide certain benefits on, on, on tax, um, as you suggest, um, because that's exactly what Brexit was designed to achieve um, in principle in the first place. Thank you, Mark. Uh, does anyone see any chances that Brexit still not uh, happening? I would have to say, no, <laughs> I think we've I think we've passed that. I think we've passed that point. Um, I think that that's very very unlikely politically. I think even uh, there was a period, obviously, where there were calls for a further refer referendum. Um, I think that people that voted to remain in the EU would no longer say for the good of our country that there should be an about turn because I think that the country was very very divided after the referendum went the way it did. Um, and I, I, I don't think that even people that would have preferred to stay in the EU would want this to, to um, be revoted upon or any change to take place. Thank you so much, Anna. Yes, I agree with just... Anna. I agree with Anna. I believe uh, Brexit is going to happen. Uh, it is a reality. It's going to move forward. Uh, the negotiation now is as to what Brexit really means, uh, which I believe nobody really knows at this point. What is Brexit? Uh, I believe uh, the UK, uh, with some restrictions, will remain part of the single market and the customs union. Some, uh, as I was saying, some EU regulations will still be applicable because that will be a precondition for any kind of compromise as to uh, remaining in the single market. There is no time before December 31st uh, to uh, make a deal as all of us would have expected. Um, but there will be some kind of a declaration of principles last minute after very tough negotiations. And uh, in this declaration of principles, something will be clear at least, which is uh, Brexit is happening. Uh, the UK is leaving the European Union. Uh, technically, uh, it left um, on in January 2020. Uh, it hasn't really left because they're still in the single market and uh, the European Court of Justice still, still hears uh, cases and controversies, uh, but it will happen in January 2021. I think it's very unlikely, like Anna was saying, after how uh, divisive a Brexit has been in the UK that uh, there is going to be any turnaround of any kind. Thank you. Thank you very much to all panelists for the information. Thank you, audience. It was a very nice uh, conversation today with you. And I'm glad that we could share this, uh, this important topic to our audience. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Excellent webinar. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you.